If you have a Bible and you want to pull it out uh, and turn to the book of Colossians, that would be useful. Um, we have been, if you're a guest, we've been uh, preaching our way through the book of Colossians. That's one of the things we, we do around here is we um, think it's important to see what God has to say to us in the way that he wants to say it to us. And so we work regularly, verse by verse, paragraph by paragraph, through books of the Bible. And we've been in Colossians for these last few weeks, and today we're going to begin chapter 3. So as you turn there um, to Colossians chapter 3, we'll be in verses 1 to 4 for the day. Um, But what I want to do to begin is uh, to give some background to help kind of give an on-ramp to this passage. And to do so, it's going to start out with the the big story Bible on-ramp and then lead to the last two weeks or so uh, in chapter 2 and what we saw there and then get to what Paul is saying here. And the reason I do that is that in the beginning of chapter one, or chapter three, verse one, he says, if then, or if therefore, you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. If therefore. And so he's, he's thinking, whatever I've just said is really relevant if you wanna understand what I'm about to say. And so that's what I wanna do here. So let me begin with that big picture of the Bible storyline. The Bible teaches us that God created all things, and he created them very good, including Man created us upright and good and placed us in a very good world. And when he did, he gave man everything, every pleasure, every enjoyment, everything he could possibly want with one command. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So there was one no in a world full of yes. God was the sort of God who said, all of it's yours except for that one. There's one no in a world full of yes. But in an act of high treason, Man rejected the rulership of God and instead listened to the voice of the devil, the voice of the serpent, and disobeyed that command and in doing so fell from his favored position. In doing so, man came under the domain of sin and death and darkness and the early chapters of Genesis show us how man just spiraled into greater violence, greater evil, and greater despair, greater hopelessness. But God didn't abandon his creation, instead, He set out to make things right. And to do this, we find in Genesis chapter 12 that God chose Abraham, one man, one family, to be the vehicle of his blessing. And in choosing Abraham and setting him apart, God essentially made a division in humanity. On the one hand, you had the Jews, the children of Abraham, and on the other hand, you had everybody else, the Gentiles, the pagans. And so there's this big division that God establishes within humanity as a prelude to making everything right. Now, according to Paul in in the book of Galatians, chapter four, this period of time in which the world was divided sharply between Jews on the one hand and Gentiles on the other hand should be thought of in the way that we think of childhood in our own lives. It was like the childhood of humanity, this period of division. So Paul says there that in the same way that children, when they're young, are placed under guardians or managers, that was a technical term at the time, or we would say something like babysitters, okay? In the same way that children, when they're young, are placed under babysitters, so humanity was placed under guardians and managers during this time of division. Jews, on the one hand, were placed under the law of Moses, which the Bible tells us was put in place, God put the law of Moses in place through angels, So we we learn about that in Acts chapter seven, verse 53, Galatians chapter three, verse 19. Uh, If you read the Old Testament, you see this figure, the angel of the Lord who shows up again and again. And so God puts in place this good and holy law to govern his people while they're young, right? While they're children. So God through angels governs his people through a good law. At the same time, these Gentiles who don't know God, who are still stuck in the ways of Adam, stuck in the ways of sin and death, are put under the dominion of darker powers, of what we might call evil guardians. And this accounts for what we know of as pagan religions, the religions of the ancient world, filled with sacrifice and dark magic, um, with their own rules and regulations. In many cases, they're very violent and abhorrent. So in this period of man's rebellion, God rules the Jews through good angels and his holy and righteous law, and he rules the pagan world, the Gentile world, through dark powers and their evil and oppressive laws. And in both cases, this is a temporary state of affairs until God would send his son in the fullness of time to deal with sin and rebellion. 
This is a temporary state of affairs. And at that time, God, God's deliverer, the Messiah, would come to rescue the Jews from the curse of the law, which they disobeyed, and rescue Gentiles from the domain of the dark powers, the domain of darkness, the false gods who kept them in awe. Now, so that's big picture. Now, as Jonathan noted last week when he preached the previous passage, these Colossians that Paul's writing to here were likely pagans who came out of that darkness in order to believe the good news about Jesus. They were delivered from the domain of the dark powers and entered into the kingdom of God's son. We saw Paul give thanks for that in chapter one. But now, it seems likely, based on the way Paul talks, that they're hearing from some other teachers who are saying, look, if you want to complete your conversion and your return to God, you have to actually come underneath this law of Moses with all of its regulations, its do not handles, its do not taste, its do not touch, all of the Sabbaths and all of these laws that God established, you need to take those upon yourself in order to be really right with God. And Paul is appealing to them, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't go back to those childhood, to those elemental spirits, to those things that were true of humanity in their childhood. Instead, grow up into maturity. Those laws were good in their time. They served their purpose during that era of history, but they were just shadows. Christ is the substance. That's what he said last week. They gave us pictures of reality. Those laws showed us pictures of of reality, but now reality has come down in the person of Jesus. The fullness of God has dwelt bodily. So don't turn from him. He's all you need. And Paul says, I know that from the outside, laws look like they're gonna be really wise. They're gonna really help you to live right. All these laws look really good when you're standing on the outside, but it's just an appearance of wisdom. It's not real. Those rules in themselves have no power to deal with your evil desires, your evil thoughts, your evil behaviors. They aren't able to overcome the cravings of your heart. You need something stronger. You need Jesus. So the point is, there's been a transition in the Bible. The Bible tells us there's been a transition both in history from that old era of division to this new era where it's all about Jesus. And there's now been a division in the lives of the Colossians. They used to be under these elemental spirits, these dark powers, and now they're in the kingdom of son, of God's son. And Paul describes this transition, now you can look at your passage here, in chapter two at the end, in terms of death and resurrection. So notice there in verse 20, if you have died with Christ to the elemental spirits, if you've died, so there's a death involved. And in, in the pr- passage we're gonna look at today, three verse one, if you've been raised with Christ, there's a resurrection. So you've died and you've been raised. And because you've died, verse 20 again, he says, why is those still living in the world? In other words, you're no longer living in that old world in that old way of doing things. You don't live there anymore. You're not alive in that. Why? Because you've died to that world. So you used to live in one kingdom, the domain of darkness with its rules, but you've now been transferred to another kingdom, namely the kingdom of Jesus, and the way that you've been transferred from one kingdom to another is through a death and a resurrection. A death to the old world and a resurrection in a new world. This is the same thing for those of you who've uh, studied your Bible before you know. In Galatians chapter two, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, I no longer live. I no longer live. What he means is, I don't live in the old way of doing things anymore. I live in a new way, by faith in the Son of God. Or in Galatians chapter six, he says that he's been crucified to the world. I think that's the same thing as he's died to the elemental spirits of Colossians 2.20. We've died to the elemental spirits. We've died, we've been crucified to the world, to the evil age, to the old way, and now we've been raised in a new world, a new kingdom. Now, how did this happen? Well, in verse 12 of chapter two, we saw this. We didn't spend a lot of time on it, so I'm gonna flag it here. Colossians 2, 12, Paul says, you've been buried with Christ in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. So baptism and the faith that it publicly reveals is the way you know that you've transferred. Now it's not just baptism in itself, it's baptism in faith, it's believing. That's why we're believers Baptists around here. We believe that we we didn't baptize any babies up here today, instead we dedicated them in hopes that this would happen to them. That through faith in the powerful working of God and then through the baptism that symbolizes it. It's also why we dunk people. 
right? It's burying. We bury them in baptism, and then they're raised into a new world, into a new way of living. And this brings us then to the present passage. So what I've said so far is they've died and they've been raised, and it's baptism as expressed through, sorry, faith as expressed through baptism that is the mark. So here's the present passage. In light of this, if you've died to that old way, if Christ has disarmed the rulers and authorities who oppressed you, if he's canceled your record of debt with its legal demands, if you've been transferred from one kingdom to the other, if you've been raised with Jesus, how should you live? What should your life look like? And that's actually gonna occupy us for the next two chapters. The next, chapter three and chapter four is, what does this new life look like on the ground? So let's look at the passage in question here. If you've been raised with Christ, what then? What should you do? What's the command? Seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Now, the first thing to note about this passage is it might be a challenge. This passage might be a challenge to someone if, for example, they'd written a book in which they urged Christians to enjoy the things of earth. Okay, which I did. I wrote that book. Um, And so... Someone might read the title of my book, The Things of Earth, Treasuring God by Enjoying His Gifts, and they look at this passage and they say, I'm gonna go with the Bible, not you. I could, I, that would be a good thing. So this passage tells us not to set our mind on, the thing, on earthly things. Instead, set your mind on heavenly things, high things, holy things, things above. And so because we're Bible people around here, we have to actually wrestle, wrestle with that question. And so in June of this year, the pastors, we've, we've decided what we're gonna do is we're gonna preach a five-part series on the things of earth in which we're really gonna drill deep into this question, how to treasure God by enjoying his gifts. And so you might think of today's passage as kind of a, a preview of coming attractions, okay? This is the teaser trailer for that sermon series as well as a part of this sermon series. So all I wanna do today is answer two questions, two main questions, and then get some application from it. The two questions are these. What does Paul mean here by the things on the earth? Like, what does that phrase mean? Don't set your mind on the things on the earth, earthly things. What does that mean? And second, what does set your mind? That's a phrase. It's a big phrase for Paul. What does set your mind mean here? So let's start with that first one. So here's the question. When Paul refers to the things on the earth, the things that we don't give attention to, does he mean things like baseball, bacon cheeseburgers, Game nights with my family, Shakespeare, working out, Star Wars, Bell's Oberon summer ale, home repairs, and church picnics on Sunday spring days. That was my week, okay? That was just, that was, I just summarized my week. That's what I did for, for this week. Um, well, the, sun, the, the church thing hasn't happened yet. That's this afternoon, so I'm anticipating a little bit. That was my week. Paul says, don't set your mind on those things. Is that what he means? Is Paul telling us that we shouldn't seek those things at all or set our mind upon them in any sense? Is that the command? And this is where attentive Bible reading, attentive Bible reading, reading carefully really helps you. Look at the next verse. Look at verse five, just for a second. Paul says in verse five, put to death what is earthly in you and then he explains sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness which is idolatry. Now here's the thing. The word for earthly right there and the word for the things on the earth, the earthly things, is the same word. Okay? So Paul doesn't leave you to guess. What do you mean, Paul? What things of earth are you talking about? He tells you right there in the passage, the things on the earth that I mean that you're supposed to avoid are things like sexual immorality, impurity, and covetousness. Paul doesn't mean created things here. He means sinful things, sinful behaviors, sinful desires, sinful activities. It is these things that we are to reject in favor of the heavenly ones, the things that are above. Now we get, in case you're wondering, is that really what's going on? We get confirmation if we really think about that second question. What does it mean to set your mind on something? What does Paul mean by that phrase? Like I said, it shows up a lot in Paul. For example, in Romans chapter eight, Paul says, that there is a mind that is set on the flesh, and he says the mind that is set on the flesh is death. 
but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. And that sounds pretty similar to what we're talking about here. Spirit versus flesh, things above, things on the earth, things below. Okay, this is the same kind of parallel happening. Or the book of Philippians, this is actually a really, a really cool one, I think. Um, I want you to listen to two passages from Philippians. If you want to turn there, you can. It's chapter three, verse 19. If you want to just listen, just listen. Philippians chapter three, Paul says this. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, many walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. So these are enemies of the cross. Paul says, their end is destruction. Their God is their belly and they glory in their shame, listen, with minds set on earthly things. That's almost identical to our passage, isn't it? Okay, you got enemies of the cross of Christ, their end is destruction. In verse six, Paul's gonna say that the wrath of God is coming upon those who have their mindset on earthly things. Their God is their belly. That is, they practice covetousness, which is idolatry. They have an earthly God, and they have their minds set on earthly things. Same words as in 3.2. Now, so that's the first passage. That sounds the same. Now, listen to Philippians chapter four, verse eight. Paul says this. This is, just, this is the, the Bible study question where it's just gonna jar. Like, how does this fit? Paul says, finally, brothers, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Now you see why that would be a little bit of a problem? What about the honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent things here on earth? Don't set your mind on the things of earth. Think about the things on the earth that are good and right and just and upright and lovely. Which is it? Now, the thing about this is um, they are actually two different words, and I think that it gives us two different categories, and we do this a little bit in English too. One of the words means something like set your mind upon, and one of them means simply consider or think. And if we begin to reflect on that difference, the difference between setting your mind upon something and considering something, a picture begins to emerge. What Paul is telling us both in Colossians chapter three and in Philippians, is that all of us have a fundamental orientation of our heart, what he calls a mindset. And, and that, that word, that setting, it's, it's fixed, it's oriented, is important. That mindset and orientation, Paul says, ought to be governed by things above, where Christ is, not on things below. So, because to orient our lives by something down here is to commit idolatry. It's to put something created above the creator. But if, on the other hand, our minds are set, if if our hearts are oriented by Christ above, then, Paul says, we're free to think and consider and attend to whatever is true, good, and beautiful in the things below. Whether whether it's in heaven or on earth, if your mind is set here, you can consider and think about all sorts of things down here. We set our minds on the things above and then consider what is good and lovely in the things below. In other words, what Paul is calling calling us to is the same thing Pastor Jonathan said last week. A life that is centered on Christ, that is rooted and grounded in the love of God, oriented by the glory and majesty and beauty of the living God. So because you've died with Christ, because your life is now hidden with him, therefore fix the fundamental direction of your life on him at all times. Now we have to think about that because here's, here's the funny thing about um, the passage. He, he says here at the beginning, fix, set your mind on things above. And then if you read through the rest of the passage that we're gonna preach through the next couple weeks, here's the sort of, sort of things he says. Just look in verse 12 and you can kind of skim with me. Put on some humility and meekness like a new robe. Be patient and forgive each other, verse 13. Wear your love on your sleeve and watch it compose a symphony, verse 14. Put peace on the throne of your heart. Be thankful. Make the scriptures at home in your soul. Sing them to one another with thankfulness. Do everything in the name of Jesus, verse 18. How about this? Wives, submit to your husbands, verse 19. Husbands, love your wives, verse 20. Children, obey your parents. It makes God happy. Uh, Verse 21, fathers, don't provoke your children. That doesn't make God happy. Are you under authority, verse 22? Then obey those over you because you fear God. Verse 23 and verse 24, do your work with all your heart because God will reward you. If you're in a position of authority, chapter four, verse one, then be just and fair to those under you because you have a boss in heaven. 
Pray without ceasing, and really, I mean it, be grateful, verse two, chapter four. Pray that the missionaries would be fruitful and bold, verses three and four of chapter four. Show the world how the wise walk by taking time away from the devil, verse five, and use salty language, the kind that gives grace, chapter four, verse six. Now, here's the thing that I notice about that passage as he unpacks the heavenly mindset that he wants us to have. It is very, very earthy. There's a lot, like the commands in that passage mean that we must spend a lot of time thinking about our family, our neighbors, our churches, our vocational responsibilities, our earthly joys. What do you think you're giving thanks for all the time, right, in those passages? The person whose mindset is governed by heavenly things spends a lot, a lot, a lot of time thinking about earthly things. The heavenly mindset is profoundly earthy even if it's oriented by Jesus. And I like that word orient a lot. Let me unpack that for a minute before we move into application. Here's what I mean. Or, orientation, right? That's the, where's the, where does the word come from? It, it's what we mean, um, if you've got a guy on a ship and he doesn't have a compass or anything else, what's he going to do? He's going to orient by the stars. And so what the passage is calling us to do is to treat Jesus like the north star in our sky, which is the fixed point around which everything else moves, So my life, he's the one who's orienting, he's guiding, he's governing, he's helping me, everything else to fit into its proper place. And so we navigate our ship through life with him as the North Star. And that means first, that Christ must be the supreme object of our desire. The supreme object. To to use the language that Paul does here, verse four of chapter three, he says, Christ, who is your life? That's what it means to make Jesus the supreme object of your desires. It's like what Paul says in Philippians chapter one where he says, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now what does that mean? It means that when you die, you lose every good thing in your life. You lose it all. Every last bit of it goes away. All the good things are, are gone. Which, and, and so if, when you die and you lose everything good, if you can still say death is gain to me because I get more of Jesus, That means that Jesus is supreme in your life or Jesus is your life. If you think that you get more of Christ and therefore anything that gets you more of Christ is gain, including death, Jesus is your life. But, so he's the supreme object of our desires, but not just the supreme object, what we focus on, he's also the supreme model for our desires. And here's what I mean. When our minds are set on Christ, on the things above, all of the other desires in our heart, all of those subordinate desires are ordered and and fit properly. It's not just that we love Jesus, it's that we love everything else in Jesus. We love them the way he loves them. Setting your mind on things above means you love God, supreme object of your desire, and that you love what God loves in the way that God loves it. You desire God, and you desire everything that God desires in the way that God desires it. And all, your heart just gets ordered properly. So he's the object and he's the model. We love him and we love what he loves. And I think that's what's going on there in verse five, which Jonathan's gonna unpack more fully next week. What keeps, here's, here's my question, what keeps the good desire for sex from turning into sexual immorality, impurity, and passion? Like, how do you keep the good desire from becoming the bad desire? Or what keeps a good desire for created things from falling into covetousness, which is idolatry? How do you make that happen? Answer, we love these created things, whether sex or culture or creation or whatever. We love them within the boundaries that God establishes and in the way that God loves them. He becomes the sun at the center of our solar system and all of the planets now orbit him properly. Now, there's many more things that could be said. What's what the, we're, that's why we're going to do a sermon series about this. And uh, just in anticipation of that, um, if you have particular questions about that topic, about how to love God and how to love his gifts and how does that fit, if, you're, if you've got questions about that, would you email them to me or to, to Jonathan? Uh, we want to collect some of those and, and know that we're targeting where the struggles are for, for the people here. So if you've got questions about that that are particular and specific that you want to wrestle with, go ahead and send them our way and that, that can help us be strategic in our series. But for now, I want to say, what does this mean on the ground? What does it mean to orient by Christ on the ground? Number one, I've got two things and then we'll, we'll be done. Number one, um, regular devotions. Regular devotions. 
What do I mean by devotions? I mean what we typically mean by something like quiet time. So about some of you may have been in context, we could talk about quiet times. My, the term that I use for it um, often is direct Godwardness. Direct Godwardness. And here's, here's it's a, that seems a little bit fancy or something like that. Here's all I mean. Your whole life should be Godward. Like the orientation, this is what this passage says. The orientation of your whole life should be towards God all the time. But there's different ways that can happen. Directly, which means that your thoughts and your attention and your, your desires are on him immediately and directly right now. You're thinking about him, not thinking about other stuff down here. That's direct Godwardness. Okay, so wh- why is this important? Well, a regular devotional life, a life in which we do direct godliness often, we read the word of God, we seek his face in prayer, we adore him, we confess our sins, we give thanks to him, we give him our requests. That kind of life is essential if we're gonna cultivate a mind that is set on things above, not on things below. Because here's the deal, you can't set your mind on the things that are above if you never take time to set your mind on things that are above. It's quite, it's that simple. If you never devote time and effort to the invisible world, right, the invisible realm where Christ is seated right now at the right hand of God, if you never take the time to set your mind there, then guess what? Your mind won't be set there. And instead, what will your mind be set on? All of the things below that are vying for your attention all the time, the things that pop up. Other, here's, here's what happens. You become like a, um, the, it's a computer screen with pop-up windows, just you, if you never take the time to get rid of all the pop-up windows and think about what you're really supposed to be doing, which is usually work, right? But instead, you're, all of these things are thrusting themselves in front, vying for your attention. What's gonna happen? You'll eventually fixate on them. You'll set your mind on things that are below. And so a devotional life, here's what it does. It anchors us. It anchors us in the love of God for us. It orders our desires. It shows us what godly boundaries are for the things of the world. It helps to keep our love for created things for, from becoming idolatrous. That's what, what are we doing there? We're reminding ourselves when we, when we seek God's face in our devotions, we're trying to remind ourselves, my life is hidden with Christ in God. I'm hidden with him. I, I'm found in him. He is my righteousness. My future is secure. I'm gonna appear with him in glory. And because of that, I can put to death all of these earthly passions now, if you want some help on this, um, Pastor David was supposed to preach this message, and I wish he would have, but he had to be out of town. Um, but it just gives me a chance to plug a, his book um, for a minute. So Pastor David's book, Habits of Grace. You want to talk about a one-stop shop for how do you cultivate a devotional life that orients you, that gets you fixed where your mind should be fixed so that you can do everything that you need to do in a way that God wants you to do it? Here's the book. And here's a little study guide for it, apparently. Now, I didn't, I didn't know that they'd done that, but now they have a little study guide for it, too. Um, so I, just, I can't commend this book highly enough. It's, just, it's a really enriching, refresher, one-stop shop for prayer and fasting and Bible study and corporate worship and a number of other things about the Christian life that orient, that give us habits, that fix our heart in certain directions. That's, so the number one is personal devotional life. Pick up David's book. Second, this is the only other one, and then I'm gonna ask some questions. Corporate worship. And here's what's funny about this. I don't know, maybe this, this, this would be just a question for you to talk about maybe with, with your friends or your family today. Pastor David, I don't know if he does it in this book, he does it in an article recently. Pastor David said, and I agree, that corporate worship is our single and most important habit. It's our single most important habit. Now that might seem odd to you. You might think, well, isn't personal devotions, me and God, more important than the corporate gathering? Now, here's the deal. In one sense, that's a stupid question, okay? Trying to play off against each other, which is more important, being with God on your own or being with God and his people is like, just don't do, do both, okay? Just do both and everything's good. But, but, so personal devotions, corporate worship, pick one, which one's better, which one's more important? That's a, it's a stupid question. But in our individualistic age, I think it's really important to stress the centrality of meeting together as God's people to seek the things that are above. It's easy in, our, in the day when people say, I'm spiritual but not religious. Often what that means is, I do what I want spiritually by myself. I don't want anything to do with organized religion. Organized religion. Meaning gathering together with the people of God to seek the things that are above. In an age where that kind of mentality individualistic spirituality over against corporate, organized, structural religion. In that kind of world, we need to say the single most important habit is corporate worship. Why? Why? 
because this kind of godwardness, what this is, David calls it in the book, corporate godwardness, not just direct, because here's the thing. Here, you're not just up to God or down to below. You're doing both kind of at once. Is really important. Why? It's the anchor for your week. The whole point of why do we do this repetition week after week after week, we come and do the same thing. Different songs and usually in a different message. So there's some variation, but we're gonna do the same things. We're gonna call you to worship. We're gonna confess our sins. We're gonna consecrate ourselves to God in, in prayer and song and and the word, we're gonna take communion, and then we're gonna get commissioned out. We do that every single week. Why? Because we wanna set our minds, we wanna anchor ourselves in who God says we are, in the gospel of Jesus. We worship the living God on the Lord's day as a way of fixing and orienting our collective hearts and minds and actions. This is, we gather here together, here's what we want to happen. Here's what, here's what I hope is happening right this minute. That's what I prayed to happen this morning, is that we meet here together, and at some point in this service, God meets you. Not I meet you, mainly, God meets you. And he, he meets you right there in your seat with the, the grace of God collides with your life, and you see Jesus as supremely valuable. You see he's my life, and then that begins to change you right then and there. And you leave here different. As we commission you out, you're different than when you came in. You're reoriented. That's what we want to happen. And so in the absence of corporate worship and personal devotions, here's, here's, here's the, my, this is me, okay, frankly. We will anchor ourselves by other things. You, will, you are a creature who needs an anchor, okay? Every one of you in here will have something anchoring you. You have to serve somebody. There will be something that is the supreme object of your desire, and there will be someone who is the supreme model for your desires, Something that you want most and someone that you listen to who tells you what else you should want. That will happen for everyone. The only question for you is will it be Jesus or someone else? Some created thing. I, I just think, when, when I think about my life and how often, just either the pleasures of this world, so the bacon cheeseburger and the baseball, can just crowd out, just get in the way and, and they begin to take on a dominance in my heart and my life that they shouldn't have or how often the cares of this world, the fears I have about the future, money, how are we gonna make this, when are we gonna do that home project, how's it gonna work, all of the fears and anxieties, the cares of this world, and what do they do? They grab me by the throat and they crush my spiritual life. So what do I need? I need to pray and I need to seek the Lord in my individual devotion and I need to get together with all you people and do it together, go Godward together as a way of anchoring and saying, no, those things matter, but they only matter as planets, not as the sun. Not as the sun. And so I just ask you today, whether you're, if you're, you're a guest, you're, if you're a member, I know he's the sun for you. That's why we let you in. <laughs> That's why we said, you, you, you said, I'm a believer, I trust in Jesus, and we said, yes, we're gonna covenant together, okay? I know that you said, Jesus is the sun. So this is a reminder, if you're not a Christian, I'm just pleading with you, don't let something else, some false God, be the sun at the center of your solar system. Jesus must be your life. Otherwise, your end is destruction. Your God is your belly. You will just coast through life and you'll find that all of the good things that God has given will not satisfy the craving of your soul. Let me close with a few questions and we're done. Here's just a, here's just a litmus test. This is how I test myself personally. I mean this. This is how I, when I'm trying to say, is my personal devotional life and is my corporate Godwardness life, is it orienting me in a way that God wants it to? Here's the questions I ask. Number one, how often does that direct Godwardness spontaneously erupt from my life? Like how often do I just find myself going, I gotta praise God for that. I gotta say thank you for that. Does it just kind of bubble out of my life regularly? Well, if, if it does, it's because I'm oriented on him. He's in my field of vision. How often does, if I feel an anxiety, how often is my reaction, take it to God, because I'm oriented by him. If I've got a burden, I'm gonna lay it on him. He's gonna carry it for me. How often does that happen? Do I always feel like he's present with me, even when I'm not thinking about him directly? Um, do I have a growing sense that he's close to me, that he's never far, that he's always looking at me and marking me and guiding me? Do I have a felt sense that that's happening? When I read the Bible, here's the third question. Is it fresh or does it feel like that's boring? That's dull. I'd rather go read the internet 
because that's really exciting. Like when, I, when you actually step back and go, wow, the stuff on the internet is more meaningful and valuable than the word of God, and, you, and rationally I go, that's ridiculous. And I go, but yeah, inside, when I'm in it, it feels, yeah, that makes sense. This is pressing, it, it matters, it's important, but it's not. Is the word of God fresh in your heart or are you just checking the box on your devotional list? Finally, here's the, most, here's the biggest test, and this is what the next few weeks, this is what, how you can gauge yourself as we preach through the next rest of Colossians 3 and 4. Is there fruit in your life? Are you making progress in holiness and becoming a more humble, a more loving, a more patient, a more joyful, a more caring person? Are you less angry than you were six months ago? Less proud than you were two years ago? Less boastful and less anxious than you were last week? How do you tell? Do you see slow but steady progress in the Christian life in becoming more like Jesus? So let me end with where the passage begins. All of these efforts to orient our life, that we do, our efforts in orienting ourselves by God, have to come out of the fact that we've been raised with Christ. There is no hope. You cannot make this happen by yourself. It must be because you've died with Christ and you've been raised with Christ. To the, you've died to the rules and regulations and you've raised with him and hidden with him. And now, in light of that, you fix your minds. You labor to orient yourself in him. And that's why we end here every week at the Lord's table, to remind ourselves of that. So I'm gonna invite the pastors to come up. And here's what I want you to do. If you're a Christian, if you're a believer in Jesus, I want you to set your mind here on this table. Set your mind. In one sense, here's, a, here's very practically a thing of the earth. It's about as earthy as you could get. Simple bread, simple wine, not complicated, doesn't look very high or heavenly or holy, and yet, this simple meal represents the grace of God. It's a place where heaven and earth meet. Heavenly grace of God signified to us in the lowly things of earth. And that's true of everything that we do in the surface. Heaven and earth meet together. The the massive, glorious grace of God through this weak, pathetic, earthly vessel. This one and these guys up here. That the grace of God through those means, that's it's an amazing thing every week to be worshiping with God's people. And so Grace is consecrated here, concentrated here in this service so that we just discover how near God is to us. He's as near as the food's about to be in your mouth, as the drink will be in your hand. He's near at hand. He's with us always to the end of the age. His body is the true bread. Let us serve you.